Okay, hello everybody. Uh, first off, thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar, Developing Irresistible Programming for Teens. I'm Susan Brackney, Director of Content and Marketing for Evance Solutions, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just want to go through some housekeeping details, and then I'll introduce our speaker and she can start the presentation. Uh, on your screens, you should see a chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or if you're having any type of technical issue, please feel free to type something there and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. Uh, we'll be track taking your questions at the end of the session. So if something comes up that you'd like clarification on or want to respond to, you can type it into that chat box and we'll be compiling all of your thoughts and questions and can address them at the end. Now if we don't get to your question during the session, we'll be sure to get answers and post them with the recorded webcast after this event. Uh, there's also specific contact information available for Sarah and me that you should see on your screen as well. After the session, you can feel free to email us directly if you have some specific questions that we may be able to help you with. Uh, we're also using Twitter today, and the hashtag is Demco Ideas. So hashtag Demco Ideas. You should be able to see that hashtag on the side of your screen in the chat box. We're monitoring that feed as well for questions and comments. So just for fun, while I'm doing introductions, we're going to pop a poll question up on your screen to help us better understand who's in the audience today. Our question is, how many teen programs does your library offer each year? And your answers, your choices are none, one to five, five to ten, or ten or more. So you can take a minute to answer that and we'll share the results before we start our program. So now on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Susan Brackney, Director of Content and Marketing for Evance Solutions, and I'm moderating today's session. Evanced was established in 2001 and purchased by Demco in 2012. We provide software to help libraries manage their events, room booking, and summer and seasonal reading programs. We'll be at ALA midwinter this year, so I hope you'll stop in and see us. So Demco and Evanced, uh, we're always interested in ways to better serve the needs of our customers, and these webinars have been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information around important topics for evolving libraries. Whether you have very limited staff and little to no funding, or you're simply out of new ideas, developing compelling teen programming can be really tough. Today we'll hear from a teen programming guru, just what it takes. She'll touch on budgeting and planning, marketing and publicity, post-event evaluations, and a lot more. You'll learn best practices from other libraries, see creative examples of programs that have worked well, and discover some new resources you can use in your own library. We're so fortunate to have Sarah Flowers with us today. She's worked in California public libraries for over 20 years. For five of those, she was deputy county librarian at the Santa Clara County Library. She's been active in ALA and the Young Adult Library Services Association for many years and was the 2011 to 2012 president of YALSA. She's written many articles and reviews for library journals. She's the author of Young Adults Deserve the Best, YALSA's Competencies in Action, and Evaluating Teen Services and Programs. So before I turn this over to Sarah, I just want to show our poll results. Well, it looks like we're, wow, got 46%, got 10 or more, 31%, 1 to 5 per year. So a smattering of, of experience out there. Um, our hope is by the, the end of this session, you'll have a new understanding of just what it takes to develop 
team programming that really works. So Sarah, we're going to put the controls in your capable hands and you can get started when you're ready. Very much, Susan. Uh, there we go. Okay, thanks a lot, Susan. And uh, there you should be able to see the uh, the opening uh, um, screen. I just want to give a little shout out here uh, on, at the beginning to Multnomah County Library and my colleague and friend Sarah Ryan, who provided this picture of some teens in her library and some other uh, some of the other pictures. The next few pictures that you're going to be seeing. So, okay, uh, programming, always uh, a challenge, and it depends a lot on, on your situation, but what I'm going to do is really talk about some basics and some ways that we can um, work it. And the first thing that you really need to think about in terms of team programming is, is why are we doing team programs? What's, oh, sorry, I think I hit the wrong, okay, there we go. Why are we doing programs at all? What's the point of doing team programs? Well, thinking about it, not just from what we want to do, but from the point of view of the library and from the point of view of the teen. So creating relationships is a big one, gives teens an opportunity to, um, to meet one another and create relationships among themselves and with the staff. Gives them a chance to explore new ideas, uh, for creative expression, uh, for uh, constructive use of time, which is a big issue, especially in those dangerous uh, 3 to 6 p.m. hours after school, which uh, can, teens can get in so much trouble, and teen programs give us a chance to help them. Um, give them a, a sense of empowerment, a sense of uh, that whole teen exploration of who they are and what they have to offer, and, and programs can help them find that. Support from non-parent adults, that's one of the, the big teen um, you know, developmental tasks is if they have, that, uh, they have that support from adults who are not their parents and also not their teachers. Um, librarians can really serve that role of giving that sounding board, a, a place to get feedback, a place to get to explore ideas in, a, in that kind of safe place. And they're fun. So uh, they can be fun and they should be fun for you. So let's go ahead and talk about then the first thing to look at, what do teens specifically want in a library program? Obviously, it's going to vary depending on the teen. But one of the things, one of the big things is a chance to show their expertise and express their opinions. They are at that age where their minds are beginning to work in new and different ways. They have ideas. They want to share them. They want to share their opinions. They want to push back a little bit. And so we can offer lots of opportunities for them to do that a lot of different ways. This is a battle of the bands at San Jose Public Library. Um, gives them a chance to show you know, the, the expertise that they've developed in learning an instrument over the years. Art shows and writing contests or other ways to do that, tech programs, book clubs, to really give them a chance to, to, to share that knowledge that they're getting in. Um, their brains are being finally at this age, 13 and up, beginning to get that real um, analytic ability, and a book club is a, is a real chance to do that, especially if you push them a little to go beyond the just, I like this book or, or whatever, but really to analyze what's going on with that. We're going to talk a lot about passive programs later on, but there's a lot of different kinds of passive programs that aren't difficult to do, but really give them a chance to put their opinions out there and share their expertise. Um, and another thing, a big piece of programming is simply time to hang out with their friends. Um, with their friends, new friends that they already have, often the teens, um, as we know, they they will travel in packs and they come to the library together and they want that opportunity to hang out with their friends. They also meet new friends at the library. So craft programs and gaming programs and drop-in programs, programs that, are, that allow a lot of interaction and that are more sort of um, informal in the, in the uh, um, operation is a good way to just give them that time to do that. They, want a safe place to try something new. And this is where you can do 
again, crafts, games, technical programs, physical activities, dance things or yoga things or, you know, anything like that, that um, they have a, a place to do it. Everybody's being a little bit silly, so it doesn't matter if they look silly. They don't have to be an expert. They can, you can do something. And if you really make it, um, you know, kind of fun and um, non-threatening, non-judgmental, it's, it's a great place to do it. And so the library can really be that safe place to try those new things. Lots of teens want a way to make their mark. They are really beginning to um, look outside themselves a little bit and look at their community. Um, youth advisory groups are really good for this kind of thing. And if and a youth advisory group, the kind of double thing is that the teens that are involved in the youth advisory group get that opportunity to share, but they can also then help you develop compelling programs for the other teens and they have those connections and they can spread the word. So youth advisory groups are really great for that. Volunteers, teen volunteers in the library are another way to do that, to make that connection. They can serve as a kind of um, uh, ad hoc youth advisory group, but they also can, they can do some of that busy work that you need done, cutting paper, preparing crafts for children's programs or other programs, whatever kind of volunteer work that your library has available. Um, but they can also, it's a way to meet some of those other things that we talked about, sh making those relationships, um, you know, sharing time with friends, creating, and a way to help. Other kinds of community engagement things, if you have activities in your community, whether it's a citywide youth advisory council, um, you know, service opportunities that you're, um, that you, you can, you know, slot your teen group into, all of those things are, are other things that teens um, are looking for. And since so many of them have the need in their schools to do volunteer hours and that kind of thing, um, the library can be a big help in that public library and the school library too. Uh, they want something new and different. They're always looking for something new and different. That's one of the great things about teens. And if you can come up with something maybe they haven't had the opportunity to do before, um, library lock-ins, um, doing reader's theater, either just for themselves or doing reader's theater for the younger kids. Um, I had a real successful program once with eighth and ninth graders doing reader's theater program as kind of the, the end of the summer reading club for the elementary school kids. Um, gives them that chance to express, but it's not quite as scary as doing actual acting because they can have the, have the script right in front of them. Um, you know, there are big programs like anti-prom and various kinds of, of fashion show type things. Um, author visits, whether it's personal author visits or, or through Skype, a lot of authors are doing Skype um, visits now, and that really gives you a great opportunity to share um, with them, gives them a chance to read the book ahead of time, ask the questions, and, and really share with authors. So that's something they don't get a chance to do in their ordinary lives. So those are just a real brief summary of some of the kinds of programs you can do and some of the reasons that you can do them. So let's talk really specifically about planning your program and what you need to do. So before you do programs, and since most of you have had experience doing programs, you know that th this is all stuff that has to be done. Um, you need to think about everything that is going to be involved. What is the space you're going to need? Um, what are the costs of things like, are you going to need, if you're going to bring in a speaker or an expert, is there going to be a fee for that? Uh, what about supplies? What are the supplies? How are you going to get them? Um, what are all the supplies that you need? Um, refreshments are pretty critical for teen programs. Um, if you feed them, they will come often. Um, promotional costs, what is it going to cost to promote it? And we'll talk about uh, promotion a little bit later on. Uh, any equipment that you might need for playing games, uh, for um, just, you know, the activities, projection, I mean, all of those kinds of things, any equipment that's needed. And don't forget to think ahead about staff. 
what are the staffing requirements? You know, you may be the only teen librarian and it may be your job to do the program, but if you are A, planning the program, B, going out and drumming up uh, donations, all of that kind of stuff, doing the program itself, how many hours is that going to be that you are going to be, for example, not able to do your regular shift on the desk? And is the library going to have to hire um, an extra help person to cover your hours on the desk? All of those are costs, and all of those are costs that your supervisor is going to want to know about. So be sure that you keep all of those things in mind, um, kind of sit down and sketch all that out when you're initially planning your program. And talk to your teens. Find out what they want. As I mentioned before, if you've got a youth advisory group, that's great. They'll be a big help to you. If you have teen volunteers in your library, talk to them about what, what would compel them to come to a program, what would compel them to ask their friends to come to a program. Because that's how you're going to get people at your program, really, is by the teens uh, bringing their friends and, sh and sharing it by word of mouth. And then all of those things I mentioned before, you're going to think about the, the budget questions, how you're going to market it and who you're going to market it to, and evaluation. It's always really good to sort of start with evaluation. Think, what am I trying to get out of this program? And how am I going to do it in order to achieve that? So let's start by talking about one of the big questions. I noticed a lot of you in the, the form that you filled out when you applied for this mentioned that you, know, you wanted to know how to do programs when you didn't have any money to do programs. So let's talk for a few minutes about how to pay for your programs. Um, there are a lot of different ways. I'm going to start as a, as a supervisor, as a manager, you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time is to think about it is as that budget line item, that, that is a, that's a big piece, if there's any way possible. And I know that a lot of you are going to say, well, that's not possible. My library can't afford to do that. But all budget items are made on the basis of priorities. And, you know, you need to think about what are the priorities of your library. And if your library has a priority of, of bringing in teens for whatever reason that they might have uh, to, uh, because of a need in the community, to get kids off the street, because of uh, uh, you know, a desire to increase the circulation in that area or in that time, to you know, whatever the reasons are, and your director will probably have reasons, uh, then, then it is something that that might need to be budgeted for ahead of time. And one of the things that you can do is to think ahead of time about, so what is it? So suppose we do do, a lot of you said you did, almost half of you said you do 10 or more programs a year, so that's roughly one a month. So how much, how much was it, will it cost? What could you do? for if you had, say, $100 a month, $1,200 a year, how, what, what kinds of programs could you do? And you can make those kinds of presentations um, to the people that are responsible for making the budget decisions. Um, if, to some extent, if it's you know, not in the budget, it, it doesn't exist. So it's a good way to think about if you can sit down and really think through what are the needs of the library and how are programming going to serve the library's needs, how is doing team programming going to fit in with the library's strategic plan and that sort of thing. Um, another th thing is you can think about is there some place else in the budget that the, um, that the money could, could come from. Um, our children's librarians friends won't be happy with me for saying this, but often there's a budget for children's programs, but there's not a budget for teen programs. Well, maybe some of that could be slid over to teens. Um, maybe there would be a way to share that. Uh, so anyway, just keep that in mind. Don't just dismiss out of hand the idea that that might actually be part of the library's budget. Meanwhile, other possibilities. Donations, certainly. Donations from uh, businesses in your community. Do uh, 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 
grocery stores that will donate food for your programs, uh, stores that will donate supply type things. Um, grants, some, some stores like Target and Dollar General and others actually do grants. Um, YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association, has grants that are available for members who are doing various kinds of programming. They give away hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in grants, and you should look at the web page and see if you, you know, qualify for any of those. Many libraries, most libraries have a Friends of the Library, and in my experience, they are often willing, um, again, you know, with if they can see what, what you're getting out of it, um, to budget some money for programs. Certainly for, you know, for they do it for children's summer reading prizes, they could do it for teen uh, programs as well if, if, you, if you present your case. So think about all of those things and look around and see if there are, um, if there are organizations, uh, commercial establishments, um, other groups in your community and in the wider world who would be willing to um, help you pay for those programs. So publicity and marketing. This is probably the hardest one and I'm sorry to tell you that I don't have, you know, a uh, just a, a simple solution that everybody can apply. I think that the key thing is to really to know your audience. Who are you marketing to? And if it's the teens, it's your most success is going to be through word of mouth. You could put paper flyers everywhere and they will never notice them and never come to your programs. That's just a fact of life. Uh, word of mouth is really the best way that you're going to get teens. On the other hand, those flyers, uh, your Facebook um, notifications on your Facebook page, uh, your library's Twitter feed, all of those things, they may well uh, reach the parents of the teens that you want to that you want to get. So you want to think about what is the message that you want to send to the parents, uh, and that might be different from the message that you that you want to send to the teens. But if you let the parents know through some of those methods. Uh, that might be a good way to um, uh, um, to get the to get the message over to the, to to the teens. So, um, excuse me, I just kind of messaged. I was having tech, technical difficulties, but I I hope it's all right. Uh, so think about the audience again. Um, Social media, we think that it should work well with teens. It doesn't tend to work really effectively unless you have a, um, already a platform that the teens are using. If you have a, um, a Facebook page that, that teens actually are coming to and commenting on and things like that, by all means use that. If you have a group of kids, a, a um, uh, youth advisory group or whatever that you are in regular contact with, by all means, you know, have a, a, a text message group set up for them and send out messages to them so that they can help spread the word. Um, but generally, it, it doesn't, I haven't found any really great uh, uh, instances of social media working really terrifically well uh, with teens in terms of publicity and marketing. For programs. If you know of something and if you have something that's really working well, please share it, share it with me in the chat because I'd like to I'd like to share that with other people. Use your coworkers um, to help with your marketing. Make sure that everyone in the library knows, not just the librarians, but everybody who works in the library knows what programs are coming up so that when they run into teens at the library, whether they're checking out their books or they're shelving in the shelves or whatever, they can mention to your target group that such and such a program is happening and do they know about it. 
Um, your coworkers also may have other contacts in the community that you don't have, and you want to be sure to use those. Maybe you know some your coworker volunteers with another group organization, a youth organization, or has a you know ha is in contact with a, a youth group at church, or in some other has teenagers themselves who have a whole different uh, you know, group of friends than the ones who come into the library. So just keep that in mind as well, um, that your coworkers can be a big help. Um, flyers, again, sort of, I mean, yeah, it's, it's helpful, especially so that to help everyone in the library know what's coming up, it's not a great way to market to teens. So next, evaluation. I always say start with the evaluation. This may be my personal bias, and I wrote, as Susan mentioned, a whole book on evaluation, so I have a lot of ideas about this. But when you're planning a program, especially a big program, a big you know, one-time program, think first about you know, who do you want to serve? What do you want them to get out of the program? What does the library want to get out of the program? And how will you know if you've succeeded? And then that's what you're going to base your evaluation on. So you want to think maybe your whole evaluation is going to be about marketing. Who did you market it to and who actually attended? And that might be, if you're going to do um, flyers and, I mean, if you're going to do questionnaires or whatever evaluation questionnaires for kids, keep them short. They're not going to answer more than a couple of questions and make sure that it's focused on what it is that you really want. If there are other ways that you can do the evaluation in terms of numbers or just um, you know having some staff on hand to record comments at the time, all of those things are probably more effective in getting real honest evaluation than doing paper evaluations. But paper evaluations can work as well. But think about, again, what you want to achieve. Do you want them to learn a skill, to have fun in the library, to just get the idea that the library is fun, to be introduced to new technologies or new materials, um, to all those things I mentioned at the beginning, sharing their skills with others, um, learning, finding out that the library um, and the community value their interests. All of those things might be your goal. So. It, when you're thinking about evaluation, think about, pick one or two of those, think about what it is that you want to achieve, and then um, think about how you're going to know if you succeeded in doing that. So next, um, I want to talk because about passive programs, because this is something I think that um, a lot of us don't take enough advantage of. Passive programs are, um, if you aren't familiar with them, are the kinds of programs that, you know, it doesn't take place, you know, in a certain place at a certain time. There are things that are the more drop-in things that the kids that are coming in the library can do any time. And I'll give you some concrete examples so you'll get some ideas of this. Um, they are very much less staff intensive. It might require some initial setup for you, and you'll see some examples over there, and it might require some follow through for you, but they are the kind of things that you can just have at hand. Um, they're great for the shy teen who doesn't necessarily want to, you know, be in a group setting, but is happy to, you know, participate. They're a great opportunity for you to meet teens one-on-one -on -one and have discussions with them. And it's always, always great to have passive programs on hand to occupy those bored or rowdy teens that, you know, inevitably are in the library after school. If you can just reach in your drawer and pull out you know, a scavenger hunt sheet or some of these other kinds of things that we're going to, I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, um, it, it, can, it can really be very useful. So let's talk a little bit about some ideas for passive programs. Um, Twitter style book reviews. A lot of the ones I'm going to share here, a lot of the um, passive programs would involve like having a, some sort of space um, to post these things. 
It could, doesn't even have, doesn't have to be a bulletin board by any means. It could be the end of a, a range of shelves. It could be a window. It could be a whiteboard. Uh, it could be just a space on the wall where you can stick something up. So this one, Twitter style book reviews, uh, you have three by five cards. They pick their books. In this case, they actually, I think, sent them in on Twitter, but you know, they could just write them down on a card and you post them, or they could send them to you on, you know, send them in Twitter with a, a library hashtag, and then you print them out and you post them on a bulletin board. These are ones where they're actually a review and they have the name, um, the name of the book, but um, you could also do them in which it's a guess the book from the tweet. So these are ones where, th this is one where you could do it where you did a few to start with. You took a few, you wrote them like these on the cards, you put them on a bulletin board and then uh, had a space where they could, either they could write them down and guess or you, they could just, you know, come to you and tell you that they knew. I mean, you, could, you can do these depending on your space, depending on your, um, uh, you know, your availability, all of those kinds of things. And then again, have, have cards or things available, have a space where they can write their own and then you post them on the bulletin board and other people can guess them. If you want to do something even more with it, you can have them, if they write one, you know, just have them put their name and their contact information on the back and then maybe periodically you can have a drawing and give a prize if you have some sort of prize. Uh, you know, that's been donated or something you can give. Maybe your prize could be, you know, waiving a certain amount of fines on their cards or something like that. It doesn't have to be something terribly expensive. And you don't have to have prizes at all. They're actually mostly pretty happy to do this kind of thing um, on their own. Other possibilities are things like blackout poetry. This is if you've got, um, if you've got a, um, supply of used books, old library books that have been discarded or books from the Friends of the Library book sale or whatever. Um, just take some pages um, out and have some markers and what they do is they just black out, um, in this case in a design, but black out the, the piece and highlight the words to make, to make a poem. Uh, magnetic poetry is another good one. This one, they've got a little, um, you know, mini whiteboard where they were doing it. I had, for many years, I actually started it as a, when, uh, for National Poetry Month and ended up sort of keeping it all the time, was near the, um, near the reference desk, which was also near the teen area, I had some shelving, just ordinary steel shelving, and I just bought a couple boxes of magnetic poetry stuck it up on the on that steel shelving and people teens mostly some adults but mostly teens would wander by at just any time and and make make poems and then other people would come along and change them and make their own and that kind of thing if you don't have that kind of space again these mini whiteboards or uh, like a cookie sheet kind of tray or something like that um, in order to give them an opportunity to to do that just, you know, at the tables. It's kind of nice to have it on like a shelf or a wall because it's more, the things are less likely to wander off, but, you know, you can do it whatever, whatever works in, in your space. Uh, Bookspine poems is another one. This is one that you could do a um, couple different ways. I mean, it might be one that you do actually in a program room where you could pull a bunch of books, either library books or, like I said, books you know, donated books or something like that. Uh, picture books are often good for book spine poetry. And uh, just give them an opportunity to do it if they can't, if you don't have the space or the books to do actual books, just send them out to look at books in the shelves and write down the titles and make a, a list of, of titles. Um, again, it's, it's a great way to occupy kids who are wandering around the library anyway. So, you know, give them, tell them, all right, go bring me back the titles of, you know, five to ten books that when you put them together make up a poem. Uh, lots of other possibilities for um, passive programs, scavenger hunts where you have a sheet and you, you know, it requires them to 
find certain kinds of things in the library or certain things on the catalog or in the databases um, are always always fun and those can be scaled depending on the uh, you know the level how old the kids are and how much experience they have with the library you can find lots of these um, online if you look uh, some of these other ones are ones again you could you just have it posted on a on a bulletin board like cast the movie um, pick a book that hasn't been a popular teen book that has not been made into a movie and say well who would you um, who would you cast in this movie and just let them offer their choices if you this one is um, you know if you just have paper and have them draw and say okay draw me a new cover of uh, one of your favorite books and then you know if you really get creative if you give them the right size paper and then you could actually make a paper cover and, and cover the book I know libraries that have done that uh, book soundtracks is is another one where again a popular book say you know the fault in our stars and you put up their list what would be what would be popular songs um, that would make a good soundtrack for this book something that you could just post and people could add to as they think of it um, voting on things like teens, teens top 10 or other kinds of things what are your uh, uh, you know what are the the um, uh, you know your favorite um, books you know from 2014 give them a, a list to choose from or something like that shelf talkers are another um, way to do it that's where they write a little blurb of a book that they like I know one um, librarian who just keeps a little cart and um, he on that cart he puts the books that the kids have turned in a little a little blurb for he he pulls out the those books and then um, leaves the little cards there on the cart so that they can come and read a teen recommendation of the book and, and that cart gets lots and lots of turnover because they do it and then that encourages more teens to write the uh, to write the blurbs themselves um, you can do a different kinds of question uh, things um, you know if you could go anywhere in the world where would you go and have them have them write all of these are things again that opportunity to share their um, opinions and their their expertise uh, so that's passive programs and and there are a lot more and you can I'll be giving you some resources at the end where you can find even more things another big thing nowadays in libraries is maker type programs um, you should all be aware if you are not that um, this year's Teen Tech Week which is the uh, initiative that's sponsored by ELSA is the theme is libraries are for making um, this is the um, the website teentechweekning.ning.com and um, you can um, sign up for it and there's lots of toolkits, materials, resources, events and activity ideas, toolkits, event planning toolkit, publicity stuff, all that kind of thing. So um, if you are interested in doing um, maker programs, you should def definitely check in on the, the Teen Tech Week um, uh, Ming for, uh, for this year's for this year's Teen Tech Week, which is in March. It's March 8th through 14th, I believe. Uh, other kinds of, of maker programs that are simple and, and not very expensive, the, this is the uh, ever popular you know, spaghetti and marshmallow structures. Um, again, doesn't, doesn't cost very much and you might even be able to get your local supermarket to donate the spaghetti and marshmallows. Um, you can look online for some different suggestions for um, uh, you know, ideas to get them started, but frankly they don't generally need ideas to get them started once you once you put the supplies out there they can usually come up with lots of good things to make themselves this is a um, a group of uh, kids boys who made it's a little hard to see in the picture but they actually created a catapult with their uh, marshmallows and spaghetti and that red target in on the back on the whiteboard on the wall was exactly that a target they were seeing if they could catapult their marshmallows at the target so they can be very creative if you just give them um, some of that stuff again you, this is something that you would need you would need space for room and 
and uh, and the supplies. Um, Franken toys are another really popular one. I think it appeals to their kind of um, you know uh, little uh, offbeatness, but they they can you can get them to start bringing over a period of weeks ahead of time to start bringing in old toys uh, that they don't uh, use anymore, and then um, you you have some glue guns and some. Um, you know, or just glue and and things like staples and stuff like that, and they can uh, create uh, uh, create their own version of of the toys. Uh, food is always a good way to get them in the door. As I mentioned before, having refreshments is always important. But also think about food based programs uh, like cupcake decorating or cookie decorating. Um, I had a, a I have a colleague who told me about she was going to do I think it was cookie decorating might have been cupcake decorating program in the library and you know like I mentioned before I mean they'd had flyers all over the place they'd been advertising it um, it was time for the program and there was like you know two kids in the program room but all they had to do was um, she just went out in the library where there were plenty of kids hanging out, teens hanging out, and said, you know, if you come in the program room right now, we're decorating cupcakes. And before she knew it, she had more teens than she knew what to do with. Um, or if you have a PA system, you can make an announcement on the PA. But those are, you know, popular kinds of programs or making, uh, you know, the two-minute mug cakes, um, that kind of thing. Um, again, making type things, arts and crafts, are still really popular, especially, you know, teens are starting to get, um, you know, really skillful, and you can do different kinds of programs, including having art contests, if you can do things where you can display their work, that is, that can be really helpful. Uh, for a more elaborate program, this was actually done in a, um, in a school setting, um, and, and that might you know, be the place that you could do it. But if you have the technology, this is a poster that was created um, using Adobe Fire, the Adobe Fireworks software, uh, in which they, you know, the team took the book that they wanted to talk about and then found images um, to go along with it and and created this created this lovely poster. Um, Teens uh, helping children is another kind of, of program. I mentioned I mentioned this a little bit before in the in terms of some of the things that they want to do in helping the community. Um, but but keep it in mind always, as I mentioned, the Reader's Theater. Um, you can almost always the children's librarian, and and in some cases that may be you uh, also. Always need help with summer reading club with the um, you know with the whatever the activities that they're doing and teens can be very helpful in that and they like that opportunity to be uh, to, to share with the younger kids helping them do the crafts helping them prepare just you know helping them like I said they have so much more skill at the craft kind of things it's it's fun for them um, to help the children as well and uh, other technical programs is another one where they they might help kids sharing um, sharing with with tech stuff. So tips and tricks. Uh, you know, everyone is going to have a different experience of this. I, I'd say one thing is if you're running into obstacles, you need to sort of step back and see if you can figure out what is going on. Um, what's the problem? Are you not, you know, did you not have a clear idea of what you were doing and what you were hoping to get out of it? Um, one of the keys I really believe is to get the teens involved. If the teens are involved in the planning and the execution, it's always going to be more successful, even though sometimes it's easier just to do things ourselves. Um, but they'll have that ownership if they are involved from the beginning, plus it'll be what they want. Um, I mentioned before about coworkers who might be helpful, not just in the publicity thing, but there are probably experts on your staff who could share their expertise. Maybe you've got someone who's a who's an excellent amateur photographer who would like to help you do a photography program, or a bird watcher, or you know, lots of different things like that. Find out what your coworkers are interested in and whether they might be they might not 
feel like they could do a program, but they might be a great resource for the program. They might be able to direct you to other people in the community who could help. Um, keep in touch with area schools. Um, we, I didn't really talk about that in publicity, but that is a, is a way if you have contacts with the teachers and librarians at area, area schools, it can be a way to get the word out um, about, about your programs. And again, also, um, they will help, they can help you if you have a good relationship in terms of what their teens need, want, what their schedules are, what's going on in their lives so that you don't schedule something uh, at a time when they're all, uh, you know, all the juniors are going to be off on a trip or doing a major project or something and not able to come to the program. So think about that. Um, don't forget about passive programming and don't be afraid. It's, you know, if it doesn't work, you try something different. That's really all there is to it. The keys to success, I've said these over and over again, giving, I think one of the real big ones is giving them options and giving them an opportunity to share their uh, opinions and expertise. It's, it's a way to really show teens that we value them, that we value their, uh, their opinions, that we value who they are as people, that they're part of the community, and that we care about them. And so all of these things are part of that, getting their input, displaying their work. Um, and uh, the options in terms of, you know, so maybe some kid, you know, it's, it's always kind of good, and that's where the passive programs come in handy, to have more than one thing so that if somebody doesn't want to participate in whatever the big program is, maybe there's something else that they can do that's related in some way um, that they can kind of do off on their own. I think that the... Um, uh, here are some, here's, I have a little summary thing I want to say, we're getting close to the end, we need to wrap up, but these are just some, some examples of some books you will have. There is a, a, a research sheet that you will be getting um, as a PDF uh, in the email that you get that follows up to this program as well as um, uh, it will be posted on the on the website. So all of these books are on there. You don't have to do these. A number of these are also publications, but there are other ones as well. Uh, you don't have to come up with this stuff on your own. There's just lots of stuff out there. If your library doesn't have these books, um, there are lots of things available on the website. YALSA has, uh, this is the, the YALSA wiki for maker and do-it-yourself programs. And I mentioned the Teen Tech Week. Uh, page. Uh, Teen Librarian Toolbox, which is now affiliated with School Library Journal, has a, 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 a section on programs, the teen programs in a box, which is adaptable um, uh, programs already sort of here's what you need, here's how you do it, and here's you know ways that you can adapt it. So that's a really good resource. Pinterest is a great um, resource nowadays for programs. This is one that I like, um, Andrea Graham's uh, Pinterest.com slash 4YA. She just has lots and lots and lots of links. If you see the link that's down in the lower left corner, Teen Programming in Libraries, that's Heather Booth's um, collaborative uh, board for teen programs in libraries. Lots and lots of great examples on that. And so just, you know, you can, you can really just kind of go crazy um, with that. And again, all of these websites as well as the books will be listed on the resource sheet. Um, this is Rosemary Honnold, who's the, she's the editor of Voya now, um, for many years uh, was a teen librarian in Ohio, and this is some um, of her um, programs, just, it's just a very simple web page, but the links are, are good and they give really specific step-by-step um, uh, ideas for doing um, for doing some of these these kind of programs. Most of them aren't don't cost a lot of money, which is one of the nice things about it. This is the Ohio Library Council's um, teen program guide, and as you can see, it goes month by month and gives suggestions for different kinds of of, of programs on a on a monthly basis. And uh, the same, you also also on their programming resources wiki page has the you know again month by month some um, calendar of, of programming ideas. Um, this is the list again. This will be on the this will be on the resource sheet that you get as well as on the um, uh, on the webcast so that you can actually link them. 
Um, I just want to, before I open it for questions, I just wanted to say, you know, in summary, I think really the key is, is trial and error. You're going to have to figure out in your situation what works with your personality, with the resources that you have available, with what your teens want, uh, you know, with their ability to show up at a specific time. Sometimes transportation can be an issue and all of that kind of thing. So maybe, you know, you need to think about, again, more about the passive programming or about doing some kind of programming where you you can go out um, to wherever they, they might be. So, you, you know, it's all going to have to, it's all going to depend on your own particular situation and, and where you are. So that's my very uh, brief uh, summary of, of some of the basics of team programming. I'm sure uh, is, since a lot of you have done programs or do programs in your libraries, I'm sure you have other ideas and other questions. So Susan, let's throw it open to questions. Yes, that was great. Uh, well, we did. We got quite a number of questions, actually. Uh, uh, first, maybe this one would be a good one to start with. What age group are you targeting when you say teen? Well, I use the um, the ULSA definition of 12 to 18. So basically, in my head, I tend to think of it as middle school and high school. Um, so that's that's kind of what all these things were for. A lot of the programs that I was talking about, um, I am aware of being done successfully with like middle schoolers. Some of them, you know, would be a little different if you were doing them with high schoolers. Okay. Uh, you mentioned at one point Breeders Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked where would be a good place to look for Reader's Theater for teens? Um, they, they maybe know of Reader's Theater for younger students, but what about older? Yeah. Well, again, if you're thinking of, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't have any titles, although I could certainly, um, you know, do do a little research and get back to you. One of the things, again, that that I had had success with is, yeah, the Reader's Theater is for younger kids, but if you have teens, especially like middle schoolers or whatever, that are like presenting it for younger children, then you can use some of those books of, of, you know, for the younger, for the younger kids. Um, but I can certainly do that in the, uh, let me look, um, I can sort of off, I can't off the top of my head think of a, of a title, but I know I've seen some, and I will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll find that and get back to you in the comments. Okay, um, we had somebody else who said our Summer Reading Club 2015 theme is Superheroes. Um, and they've been tossing around the idea of having a Comic-Con as a kickoff event for teens. Uh, they were wondering if anyone else has ever done anything like that, uh, or if you have any advice or suggestions about doing something like that. Well, that sounds really ambitious. Um, I would be interested if anyone else has, has done anything like that, and, and maybe somebody else can share that. My advice would simply be to, you know, that something like that is going to require a lot of planning, and I think even the six months or whatever that you have between now and then, I, you know, maybe it'll be enough depending on what you're, you know, if you want to try to bring in. Uh, you know, if you want to try to bring in speakers, um, or you know, what you're, how you're, how you're envisioning it in terms of, or is it just an opportunity for kids to show up in costume and you know have you know share? Uh, kind of depends on how you are thinking of of organizing it. I mean, I think it could be extremely, extremely popular, but I think it would be something that um, I would really want to think through what I was. Um, hoping to accomplish and what, um, you know, what kind of space and what kind of equipment I would need. Like I said, speakers, I think speakers would be great if you had, um, you know, one of, uh, uh, if you had a, a comic book artist or, um, you know, somebody who was involved in some way in, in, uh, um, in the movies or, you know, anything like that. Some of those would be great, but they would require, you know, really advanced planning. Okay, maybe we have time for one more. Um, let's see. My library system spans a wide spectrum of economic and racial categories. What strategies work best 
in under-resourced and or low literacy communities? That's a tough one. It is, and that's one, um, you know, that's really going to, um, I, I think you need to talk again, you know, to the teens in your community and find out. I mean, certainly there are, I didn't talk at all about some of the more formal kinds of programs like homework help and, um, uh, you know, literacy type programs or even programs like, um, you know, college planning or, you know, SAT taking or, you know, um, some of that kind of stuff. Some of those things um, work very well because they're, they're really looking at, um, you know, how to, how to do that kind of thing, um, especially when, for example, you know, the, the parents have not gone to college or whatever and they're looking at that. Also, um, workforce development kinds of things, how to, uh, programs for helping kids um, uh, apply for jobs, how to, you know, what do they need to know to go on a job interview or to um, do, um, uh, uh, you know, fill out an application, some of that kind of stuff. This is stuff that they know that they're going to have to do at a young age often. Um, so some of those kinds of more kinds of um, social focus programs um, might be available, but again, this is something that I would want to talk to um, the, the teens themselves about and find out, you know, is that something that you want or, you know, is it more um, the you know sort of the distracting <laughs> kinds of kinds of things you know whether it's gaming programs or or uh, uh, you know arts and crafts and and that kind of stuff so it's going to depend somewhat on your community but some of those kinds of things like homework help and college planning and workforce development are all um, I know very um, much done in some communities that I'm aware of that are more uh, you know low income and low literacy. Okay, well, fantastic. Uh, we're going to wrap things up now. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your insights and ideas on teen programming that other folks can use in their libraries. Uh, we hope that everyone was able to take away a few new ideas to try. Uh, there were some great ideas and, and discussion, and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. Uh, you'll be receiving a survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did. Uh, please take a few moments to fill this out. We love your feedback so that we can make these sessions even better in the future. Uh, feel free to comment on other topics that you'd like more information on or speakers that you'd like to hear from so we can consider building some of those things into our future schedule. Uh, we've received great feedback from our previous webinars that's really helped us focus on the topics that you're most interested in. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up to this presentation that will include a link to this webcast. So if you missed something or you just want to review, you can go back and refresh yourself on the presentation or share it with colleagues. Uh, next week you will be receiving a second email that will include resources such as the slides and a Q&A log that documents and answers the questions that came up today because we didn't get to all of them. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us. Uh, please consider joining us on February 11th at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, when DEMCO's Janet Nelson presents Planning for the Future of K-12 through Libraries, Multifunctional Learning Commons, and watch the DEMCO website for additional upcoming programs. Uh, you can also check out the New Ideas and Inspiration site for webinars that we currently have available on demand that you can watch whenever it's convenient for you. Uh, and we hope that you will consider joining us for future events. Again, we're so glad you joined us and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>